everybody. Welcome to Note School TV today. We have a very special guest and a very special way of doing Note School TV today. Recently at our Note Expo, I asked attorney Jeff Watson to assemble essentially a risk management blueprint for all of the real estate investors that are very uh, involved or, very, or want to be involved in doing subject twos. So Jeff really assembled a, 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 an issue explaining to us in various states, there are a series of laws that relate to being able to do a sub two, particularly with a delinquent borrower. And so he lays that out in this presentation. This was his note expo presentation. I would say to you, if you have any interest at all in doing subject twos, this is a must watch. Now, let me suggest to you, that I want you to share this with your friends. This is an important presentation. Note School simply wants to get the information out to make sure that you can do it correctly and safely and that you are fully aware of all the compliance elements to this. We think sub two is a gigantic opportunity, but it also must be done properly so that you don't accidentally break some laws that you didn't even know you were breaking. That's what Jeff's presentation is about is about. And so you guys stay tuned for a very, very great presentation by my friend, attorney, Mr. Jeff Watson. Wow. What an honor to be here. Eddie, thank you. Professor, thank you. Um, it's, it's truly an honor. I, and I knew this was going to happen. I came prepared. Um, I was going to, I know it. So let me just, I got to read this because it's, it's, it's there. I'm on a mission. I call it Serious Sub 2. Ladies and gentlemen, it is no longer amateur hour. The days of dabbling in a rising real estate market are over. That market will no longer forgive ignorance or mistakes, but allow me to allay your fears. There are multiple ways to do subject to transactions in the current market. If you have the suspicion that some of the subject to promoters out there on the internet are not completely on the up and up, your gut is right. However, subject to transactions, when properly done, can not only change your life and your balance sheet, but they can spare homeowners from difficult painful decisions. The key is learning how to do subject to and creative transactions correctly. Until now, no one has been listening to Eddie Speed and taking these issues seriously, specifically tax code application regarding how these transactions are structured, ignorance of state foreclosure rescue laws, incorrect usage of trust for buying subject to, and overall sloppy and incomplete paperwork. Will you allow me to begin to educate you? Today, subject to transactions are the best entry point into the residential real estate market and related seller finance and note space. If you are the type of investor who wants to help sellers with their problem properties, make serious money for yourself, and legally stick it to the IRS, then you're in the right place. Some of you are looking at that title and you're going, where's he going with this? And we'll get there. But I want to tell some of you who don't know who I am, and Ron, thank you for that, that kind introduction. Some of you don't know that I practice law now for 31 years in the state of Ohio, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do it right. I'm general counsel to RealFlow, National Real Estate Investors Association, Note School, which is our host here today, and National Wealth Builders out of Dayton, Ohio. I, too, have been a real estate investor for over 28 years. I'm a full-time practicing attorney, primarily representing certain established real estate investment companies and self-directed IRA clients. Some of my accomplishments changed the law in the state of Ohio five times, four times through litigation, once through legislation. I've also done other accomplishments, including changing national housing policy three times, 
co-authored amendments to change Dodd-Frank, Safe and Truth in Lending. 2008, revolutionized short sale transactions. I'm a board member of Quest Trust Company with fiduciary responsibility for between two and three billion dollars worth of assets. It's a privilege to be the only non-Texan on that board. And I've got two real estate investing clients that have made the Inc. 500 list. Not the Inc. 5,000, but the Inc. 500 of privately held fast growing companies. One client did it two years in a row and I co-own a company that also did it back in 2011. But I have to begin to tell you that this presentation is designed to provide you with accurate and authoritative information with regard to the subject matter covered. This is education. I'm going to say that again. This is education. This is not legal advice. It is provided with the understanding that the presenter is not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, professional, or psychiatric advice. If legal or other professional assistance is required, the services of a competent professional must be sought. The three worst sources of legal advice for real estate investors. I just have to tell you before I go into them, I think that Facebook has an amazing law school. <laughs> there are so many lawyers, and accountants, and doctors, and economists, and financial experts on Facebook. It's truly refreshing how much free, amazing expert advice I can get. No, but seriously, number one is, I've heard. Number two is, they say, and my all-time favorite, I read on the internet that. Those are the three worst sources. But we're going to move ahead. Folks, if you have not figured it out, we are no longer in Kansas. Okay? The real estate market is not what it has been for the last several years, last 10 plus years. Now, this was an iconic moment in film history where a young lady and her little dog stepped nervously into the sunlight of a brand new world. A cacophony of color, sound, changes, and strange little people with squeaky voices, to which the immortal words were said, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Friends, we're no longer in a market that will forgive mistakes. Okay? Even though she was confronted by unfamiliar surroundings and terrifying dangers, Dorothy managed to conquer the challenges of Oz and return home victorious. It's a great story that offers valuable lessons in real estate investing for us today. Times change, markets change, and we must deal with those changes, and we must listen to those who have been through multiple cycles. And I have men in my life like Eddie Speed that have been through more cycles than I have been through. And those are the men I look up to, those are the men I listen to, those are the men I collaborate with. And these are the men that know where we're going because they've been there, they've done that, they've bought the t-shirt, they've paid the bills, they've stitched up the scars, and they're still standing. So, with that, I'm going to tell you, today's regulatory and housing landscape is very different from the 90s and the 2000s, the last time subject to was a popular transactional methodology. By a show of hands, how many of you were investing in the 90s? By a show of hands, how many of you were investing before 2008? Not the majority of the room, okay. So the world that we're in today is vastly different from a regulatory and a legal standpoint than the last time we were in a market where subject to and creative financing and owner selling and owner financing was popular. Okay, it's always been there, but now this world is different. So let's talk about some of that. So there are some sub two problems that you must, you must avoid. The wrong loans taken sub two will give you bad deals. So let's talk about some of those wrong loans. FHA and VA. I would not, under most circumstances, take a subject to take subject to an FHA or VA loan. 
And let me give you a couple of reasons why. There is a much higher risk of that loan getting called. There is this common consensus, it's not 100% accurate, that a borrower can only have one FHA loan at a time. It's not 100% true, but there's this common consensus. So if you take over a subject to loan from somebody this year, and two years from now they get their life organized, and they want to go do another FHA loan, they're going to be told they can't do it because you're still making payments on their other one. And that's going to cause a problem. So we want to be careful there. Now, there is a higher consequence if these loans get called because you're dealing with a directly federally backed, federally insured loan. And they will like that a whole lot less. Now, does this mean I will never do one of these deals? Absolutely not. Let me tell you why I would do one of these. If I could take over an FHA loan where that borrower has been paying on it for seven, eight, nine years, where they've got strong amortization, where a lot of that payment is now going to principal reduction rather than interest costs, and if I have a private money source lined up that at the first hint, at the first hint of a problem, I can immediately pay off that VA or that FHA loan, I'll go do that deal. I will go do that deal with those two provisions in place. What if it, but if it's a brand new FHA loan with less than a year making payments on it, no way. That owner's got to stay in that house for a minimum of a year. All right. Number two, the modify the loan, then acquire subject two. That is not always a good idea. In fact, more often than not, it is a bad idea. Let's get into why. You have to be ultra careful of the representations and warranties being made in the loan modification application. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are such a nerd that you will read loan modification applications? Yeah, there's a few of you in the room. I respect you, appreciate it. I've done several of these. I've looked at several of these and the representations and statements that the borrower owner occupant is saying, I'm making this modification so that I can continue to remain in my home. I'm sorry, I will not be party to a material misrepresentation to a federally insured lender. Because you know what we call that? We call that wire fraud and mail fraud. And that means that we might have a chance to model orange at Club Fed. And I'm not interested. Okay? Now, some of you are already like, oh, Lord, he is scaring the daylights out of us. Relax. Okay? Because some of you are saying, well, Jeff, what about all those bigger rearages? You see, I thought the strategy was if we can modify, and that way we can solve the bigger rearage, then we can take it subject to. Relax. There are other techniques in the creative investor's toolbox that can work in this situation, and we'll get to them in just a moment. Okay? There is, this is the time. This is the time to put away the big cash-buying hammer. This is the time to stop being a one trick, a one type of one type offer buyer. This can no longer be a routine run of the mill business operation. This is where you're going to have to start thinking about how you're going to do these deals. You've got to have a full arsenal of tools. Okay? And now there's the great question is what about those bigger ridges? I'll answer that. I'll answer that. But before I do, I want to talk to you about what I think is probably one of the most clear and present dangers in the creative finance sub two space today. And I have seen this come up more in the last 90 days than I've seen it come up in the last 10 years. Ignoring your state's foreclosure rescue statutes. Allow me to elaborate. There are approximately 20 to 29 states, I no longer have a complete list in my memory, it's been time, time's passed, of about 20 to 29 states that beginning in 2006 through 2010 enacted legislation to protect homeowner occupants from scam investors trying to steal their equity during the last mortgage meltdown foreclosure crisis. States like Florida, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, Colorado, California, Arizona, Utah, they have these statutes. I used to read them and used to know them in and out. I no longer do. I've learned, I move on to other things. But the general theory is this. Transferring title 
from a person in default, i.e. more than 30 days late on their mortgage payments on their primary residence, without, repeat, without paying off that debt, and any senior debt is potentially criminal in many states. Specifically, I think of a statute I just looked at yes, last week, Colorado makes it very clear as to that. And Colorado statute is modeled after what is in Oregon, California, and in Washington State. And then other states have picked up and modeled after Colorado. So is there a way around it? Yes, there is. Okay? And 20 or more of these states have these foreclosure rescue laws. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is that when you're ready to do a deal, you're going to, in the privacy of your own home, in the comfort of your own office, you're going to, whether you're wearing fuzzy slippers or not, sit down, pull up your favorite browser and search engine. I don't care if it's Yandex, Bing, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, Google, whatever it is, and you're going to type in the name of your state, and you're going to type in the phrase foreclosure rescue statute or foreclosure rescue law, and you're going to hit enter. And if your state has one, it'll show up in the first several results. Click on it and read it. Now, you might live in the state of Ohio. You might live in the state of Texas, which to the best of my knowledge, neither of those states have those statutes on the books. And you're just going to go, that's one thing I don't have to worry about. And you're right. But if you want to move across the state line, like where I do, if I want to go over to the state of Pennsylvania, i got to pay attention to that. Okay? So that's what we do. Now, if your state is one of those 20 or so states, not only do you want to read what is required, but because each state is different, you want to consult with a local attorney that is understanding that statute. So I'm going to just, no bashing attorneys allowed right now, because I am one. But in all likelihood, if the practitioner that you're talking to has been practicing for less than 10 years, they have no clue. Because for the last 10 plus years, these statutes have faded off. No one's had to know about them. Because we've had a market that's just been raising the value of our properties, and you could always refinance or sell, and so you weren't faced with a lot of foreclosure stuff. And we know in the last several years, foreclosures were way down for a lot of reasons. Yes, they're starting to trend back up. But if you can't, if the attorney doesn't know it, they haven't dealt with it, find the next one. Keep looking. Keep looking. Remember, you are the one that's hiring the attorney. They're auditioning for the job. Don't let them bully you. Now, this is the big question. Can you still work a deal? Yes, you certainly can. Yes, you certainly can. Can you do it the garden variety way? Not quite. You've got to work with it a little bit, okay? Should it be a loan modification? No way, no how. So, let's explore your options. Now, because I have limited time, I can only explore two of them with you today. Does that mean that these are the only two? Absolutely not. But remember the scenario that we're talking about, because I'm here to teach. I'm here to encourage. I'm here to show you that, yes, you can still do it despite certain obstacles, and I want to warn you about those obstacles. And so I've probably scared the daylights out of you. How many of you, by show of hands, are scared? Okay. The nervous laughter tells me a little bit right there. All right. So let's explore the options. Number one, always pull title. On any sub two creative structure, owner finance deal, always pull title. Current owner lien search or O&E, always pull it, okay? Are there vendors here that can help you do that? Absolutely. Do you need to take advantage of that? Absolutely. Number two, locate and interview an attorney as to that specific state statute and to subject to purchases. Ask them, what do you know about this statute? What do you know about subject to transactions? If you get some bluff, if you get some bravado, if you get some hot air, next. If you get somebody who looks at you and says, yeah, I've done it. Yeah, I know about it. It can be done. There's your huckleberry. Okay? They might be teachable. Then you can start introducing them to the concepts you're learning here and through note school and move forward. Now, option number one, bring the payments current. Remember, we're talking about a property where the homeowner is behind in their payments. 
And this is why they're willing to discuss selling to you subject to. Option number one, bring the payments current as part of buying the property via land installment contract. Why am I doing it this way? Title remains in the homeowner's name. We're not violating the statute, but we're solving their problem and we're putting us in position where we now control the house. We now control the property. We're solving their problem. We're complying with the law and we're putting it to where we can make a deal where we make money, okay? Your trustee should be the buyer vendee on that land installment contract. Six months later, after you've kept the payments current, modify the land installment contract into a deeded sub two transaction. We just have to take it step by step. The frog has got to hop from a couple extra lily pads to get to the shore. No big deal, but we can do it. Y'all have got the tools, the skill, and the know-how to do it. Okay? Option number two. This one might be my favorite. This one might be my favorite for a host of reasons. Lease the property, master lease the property with an option to purchase. Both of them, not just master lease, but master lease with the option to purchase. Bring the payments current with your option, what the money you use to bring the payments current is your option consideration and you're prepaying some rent. Have that option to purchase recorded. An original blue ink, wet ink, notarized option to purchase, get it recorded. And then maybe even record a mortgage or deed of trust to secure the option. Put in that instrument the amount of money that you're paying to bring it current. Later on, you can then convert that lease option to a subject to. But what does it give you in the meantime? It gives you control. It gives you the right to put the house back out on the rental market. It gives you the right to test drive the house and see if you really like it. Because you got to remember, when we master lease a property with an option to buy, we're dating it. We're dating that house. When we take it sub two, we've gone down the altar. We've, we've gone down the aisle to the altar. We've married the property after saying, I do. We're committed long term on that one. You do a sub two transaction. You are now morally committed to making sure that you take care of that house until that loan is paid off or you have sold it and it's paid off. But if we master lease it, we're dating it. Yes, we might even be engaged to it, but we're test driving it and we've got a chance to adjust and move forward. But there's one more subtle thing that we're doing with both the first option and the second option. And this is powerful. This is what I want you to understand. Remember what I said about where you structure deals, where you help the seller, you add to your balance sheet and you legally stick it to the IRS? This is where we're showing the IRS our intent to be a long-term property holding investor. A long-term property holding investor. We're not a dealer. We're investing for the long term. I'm holding an option, which is a long-term play. Okay? So I'm not a dealer. I look differently. I will then be taxed differently. I will not be taxed nearly as heavily. And this is one of the things that I've I shared with you at the beginning. There's a lot of incomplete and misinformation regarding the tax consequences of some of these transactions. And I've spent some time really digging into this. And one of the things that made me so much more comfortable with the legality of subject to transactions, because there's still people out there running around going, they're not legal. What made me so much more comfortable is when I sat down with my good friend John Heyer, a tax attorney, and he and I went through a number of federal tax court cases, and federal judges are listening to the IRS argue about the merits of the way the subject to transaction was structured. Never once was the argument made that it was an illegal or sham transaction. Never once. And I'm like, let me see if I got this straight. The IRS, government attorneys, are never saying that these are illegal deals. That's a good point to know. So that means when you do these things right, these are great deals. So I took that ahead and I said, we got to figure out a way how to get all this nailed down. So option number two 
is lease it with an option to purchase, record your option, secure your option if you need to with a mortgage. Now you're going to say, well, Jeff, you sound so paranoid. Yes. You know why? Because some title examiners, if it doesn't say deed or mortgage, they don't pay attention to it. Okay? So I want to have something that they will catch. Now, here's something else to think about. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're in the right room. You're in the right room. Funding. Be willing to share the deal with a private money partner. They fund the cash needs of these deals, bringing in a rearage current in exchange for either the option, oh wait, they fund the cash needs for either of these options, options one or option two, in exchange for a piece of the deal. Now, you're going to say to me, Jeff, where'd you get this idea from? Well, I got this idea from a friend of mine. Met her several years ago when she was just a beginning investor. Now she's built a portfolio of about $10 million, primarily through subject to and lease options. Her favorite strategy is to bring in a private money partner for a piece of the deal, one third to one half of the deal, depending upon how much money she needs, because her attitude is, Jeff, I would rather have half of or three quart or two thirds of a really good deal than nothing at all, or instead of having all of a bad deal that I'm looking over my shoulder on. Okay? So a trusted private money partner are a far better choice than risking mortgage fraud or loan fraud. I would rather you bring in somebody with money catch up the back payments, let them have a piece of the deal, payment stream, equity piece, combination of the two, than to do a modify, take it sub two transaction, okay? I'd rather you do it where you take and have half of a really good deal that's got cash flow and equity than all of a deal that's got you looking over your shoulder for the next seven plus years. All right, let me talk about another thing that you must be aware of that I want you to cover for yourself and to protect yourself. When you're doing a creative finance transaction, particularly a subject to transaction, there are people out there saying, oh, you got to get a power of attorney. You got to get a power of attorney. Yes, you should. And it should be a limited durable power of attorney, limited as to just that real estate transaction, just as to that property. It needs to be durable, which means it will last for a long period of time, even if somebody gets sick, if somebody gets, becomes incompetent, it still remains in full force and effect. But there's a burden that comes with taking, obtaining a limited durable power of attorney for which you need to beware. A fiduciary duty is now placed upon the shoulders of the attorney in fact. They now have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of the principal, the homeowner, the seller that gave them the power of attorney from whom they're buying the property subject to. So let me give you an illustration of the difference of what fiduciary duty means. And I think of it this way. In my hometown, there's two banks across the street from each other. So picture yourself, it's five minutes before closing time just before a holiday weekend and you've got two deposits to make one at each bank one of the deposits is for your own personal account the other deposit is for an account over which you have a fiduciary responsibility or fiduciary duty and you know full well that you can't get them both done which one do you pick the fiduciary duty one, of course. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that you might bounce a check over the holiday weekend? Yeah. Does that mean that you may not have access to capital? Yeah. But did you do the right thing? Yes. That's what a fiduciary duty means. So you've got to act for the benefit of the seller, homeowner, not for yourself. Now, the good news is this. You can clearly act for the mutual joint benefit of both parties, yourself and the seller, as long as it's something that you've disclosed in writing that you're going to be doing and it's consistent with the powers and the duties that are in there. So the most common example is 
I can use my limited durable power of attorney to go ahead and adjust the homeowner's insurance or the property and casualty insurance on that property because I'm doing this to protect the homeowner because if I don't make a change, they're going to be in trouble. Why? Because they had the property insured with a homeowner's policy, but they're no longer in the property. Therefore, there should not be any coverage, even though they keep making the premium payment. So I have to go and use that limited durable power of attorney to correct and adjust the insurance. Often what I'll do is buy a brand new insurance policy where my trustee as the buyer of the property is the primary insured. The homeowner from whom I bought it is an additional insured. And the lender whose mortgage I'm taking subject to is listed as a loss payee. Now, I use the power of attorney to do that, and that's completely within the bounds of that power of attorney. That is the correct way to do it. Now, what I just covered there, you're probably going to want to take some notes on it. You should have taken some notes on it, because that solves, I just told you, how we take one of the issues that can be a problem, and how I use it to solve one of the other two problems with the subject issue, because a lot of questions they get about subject issue is, well, Jeff, what about insurance? I just covered it. But if you weren't taking notes, let me go back over it again for you, okay? So what we do is we use that limited durable power of attorney to go buy a new insurance policy. The trustee of my trust is the named insured because my trust is taking title through my trustee. The seller from whom I'm buying the property, they are listed as additional insureds with that magic language, as their interest may appear, Atima. And then I make sure that the lender from whom I'm taking the property subject to, that debt, is listed as a loss payee on that same policy. Now I use that limited durable power of attorney, as well as an authorization to release information, to contact the escrow department of that servicer, because the servicer is not the lender, and I make sure that I update the insurance information with them. I make sure I get to the right person in the right department in, that escrow part, in the escrow division of that servicer to update new insurance information. Now, you're going to say, well, Jeff, why can't I just leave the homeowner's policy in place? Well, it's no longer a homeowner's policy because they're no longer occupying the property. Well, Jeff, can I have them call their insurance company and have them change it to a landlord policy? Yeah, you could, but they're really not a landlord. So let's just go ahead and get a new insurance policy in place where you're in control, where you've selected the insurance agent, where you've told the insurance agent what's going on, and you get the deal pushed through without there being a problem later on. Well, Jeff, isn't that going to trigger the due on sale clause? No, it won't, because what you're doing is you're updating the insurance information. That's all you're doing. You're just going to update the insurance information. All right. Now... <laughs> this I probably have saved for last for a good reason because this is the worst of them all this is the worst of them all and you're going to like well Jeff what do you mean well when you take a property and you acquire it subject to or on owner financing or a combination of the two, which is what you'll probably be doing, you're making a commitment to make those payments month after month after month after month. And you don't want to do business with people who can't honor their commitments. So the number one reason that I see investors stop making payments on their deals is because they have bad cash flow management. Now, a couple days ago, Mr. David Richter was here, and I think his methodology is a strong suggestion because, folks, you have to run this like it's a business. You have to run this like it's a business. You have to you start thinking about forward-looking cash flow management on these investments. You're no longer shooting from the hip. We're now here. This is the opportunity that we've been waiting for, some of us, for years to take advantage of the shift in the market to build serious wealth. Note investors are not run and gunners. 
Node investors are not hustlers. Node investors are thinking strategic business owners that make long-term decisions. That means you've got to have good cash flow management. That means if you don't have reserves, if you don't have uh-oh money, if you don't have what-if money, you're going to have a problem. Now, when you go ahead and sell these properties to a penalty box buyer, set aside some of that large down payment money for reserves. Please do not take that money and go to Vegas. Please do not take that money and go to Costa Rica. Don't skip out. Have it there for the rainy day. Have it there for the what ifs, for the rut rows, as the dog in the, Je in the Jetsons would say. All right? Now, the one that has probably struck me the most is there are individuals out there, I've seen them in the past, advocate, well, I'll take the property subject to, I'll make a few payments, then I'm going to stop making payments because it's a strategic default. I'm going to try and negotiate a discounted payoff. That is criminal. Individuals who have done that have spent time at Club Fed, and they deserved to do it. Okay? Was not a good decision. If you take over a property subject to, you're committed to making those payments until that loan is paid off. When you enter into a seller finance transaction and you put your name or your trustee puts their name or your company puts its name on a promissory note secured by a mortgage or a deed of trust as part of the seller financing because you've negotiated a great seller finance deal, you're committed to make those payments. Just like when you resell that property, that buyer's committed to make those payments to you. So now, let's move to the next one. Inadequate disclosures to the seller. It's been my experience that sometimes the seller in these situations develops life-altering, life-changing amnesia. And you're going to say, well, Jeff, that sounds funny and I want to laugh, and you should laugh, but sometimes it gets really serious. You see, when you meet them and they're in a really serious situation and you save them and you literally do them a service, that's great. But then after they get their act together, they, maybe they get through that rocky marital relationship. Maybe their employment situation changes. Maybe their health improves. Maybe they get sobriety, whatever it is. Sometimes then as their life changes, they forget just how much you did to help them out. And they now think that they remember hearing you say that, oh, I'll get that paid off in three years and it's been two and a half years, and it's time for them, in their opinion, to go buy another house, and they want you to pay it off. So when you have inadequate disclosures to the seller, that can happen. So my principle is this. To be clear is to be kind. I want to communicate with great clarity when I talk to a seller. I want to not only be verbally clear, but clear in writing. And that means I will get it in writing, not just once, not just twice, but sometimes three and four times. So confused minds will often say, well, that's illegal. But an unconfused or a clear mind will understand what you're doing. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, true story. It happened to me several years ago, back um, when I began representing real estate investors. Local investor, friend of mine, did a subject to transaction, took the documents I gave him and provided to him, had the seller sign them. Everything was great until the seller developed amnesia about a year later. Seller went to a local attorney there in the area where I live. Local attorney filed suit on behalf of the seller going after my client. And... Um, said all these things that my client had promised. And it didn't start out too good because the lawyer that they hired knew the judge a whole lot better than I did. 
And so for the first couple rounds of filing paperwork and so on, I could tell I was getting set up to get homered. Now, how many of you know what homered is in the courtroom? Okay, that's not a good experience. I've had it happen, and it's not cool. I was getting set up to get homered because this lawyer had a much better relationship with the judge than I did at that time. We finally got to a pretrial conference where it was just the other lawyer, the judge, and myself. And I'm the defendant, so I go second, which means the other lawyer got to go first, and he got to talk for about eight, ten minutes about all the terrible stuff that my client had done and so on, and what promises my client had verbally made to his poor client and so on. And I just waited. Finally, the judge looked at me and said, what do you got to say for yourself and say for your client? And I said, Your Honor, I said, there are some several disclosures that Mr. Smith's client signed that Mr. Smith never knew about because his client never shared it with him. Allow me to share it with you. And I slid a copy over to the judge and another copy over to opposing counsel. And his last name was Smith. Really was. The judge spent the next three minutes sitting there quietly reading the multiple pages of disclosures, seeing where it was initialed, signed, dated, and notarized. After he got through looking at it, he closed it up, looked over at the other attorney and said, what the flip are we doing here? And he didn't say that particular word with an F. <laughs> got up, walked out. Case was over. Done. <laughs> Next day, there's a dismissal notice in the mail. We're done. Now you're going to say, well, Jeff, that's a great story, and it's a true story. Uh, my client's first name is Frank. Last name begins with a W was there in the Ashtabula County Court of Common Pleas. Judge Mackey is now retired. But it's a true story, and it's a story you need to remember because sellers will have amnesia. We, therefore, document everything in writing. Now, will all of them know? Because you got, but remember this principle. If not written, it didn't happen. Real estate is done in writing. Statute of frauds is abundantly clear. And so you need to make sure you've got it well documented and in writing. Now. I'm going to conclude with this. We're at a time in our country with this economy, with this shifting market, and this market's going to go on for a while. We're at a time where we can do one of two things. We can run to the sidelines and wait to see what happens, or we can move ahead convinced that we can do better and higher better and higher. And so uh, what I want to share with you is I have a dream of real estate investors being willing to invest the time and energy into their education and knowledge to learn what the laws are that apply to the transactions that they contemplate on doing. I envision real estate investors being willing to do fewer, better, more profitable deals that enhance their communities, lower their stress, and make their lives more richly rewarded. I have a dream of real estate investors, yeses being yes and noes being no, of people of integrity who do what they say they're going to do. I envision real estate investors being recognized as a benefit to their community rather than a source of friction or an object of scorn. I have a dream of real estate investors being praised and commended by their communities rather than being condemned as greedy opportunists. And I have a goal of elevating the standard by which real estate investors improve their communities. We are in a war, a war of ideas, a war of culture, and a war of words. If you have not been paying attention the last few years, real estate investors have been getting a bad rap, especially landlords. And when landlords are driven out of the market, everybody suffers. Everybody suffers. But when investors, whether they're landlords, whether they're buy and fix and resell, whether they're other types of individuals, and they all need paper. They all need notes. It all pins back to notes. It all pins back to the structuring of deals correctly and wisely. When that's done correctly, communities benefit. 
we don't have vacant, ugly, boarded up houses. Instead, we have houses where families live there. And my dream is for them to be able to afford to own it rather than just rent it because I want people to gain the benefits of home ownership. I want to see families break generational curses of long-term poverty. I want to see them begin to build the wealth that economists talk about where long-term homeowners have 43 times greater wealth than long-term renters. But the fundamental thing here is this is a situation where individuals, sometimes we'll call them mom and pop investors, they're the linchpin to making this happen. Not government programs, not big corporations, not major hedge funds, but individual investors that can relate to other people on an individual level. This is where you have the opportunity to do good for the community have fun doing it, be proud of what you do, develop a legacy, and make a great living and build wealth doing it. And those are the things that I want you to do. Those are the tools I want to give you. And with that, I conclude and surrender back the balance of my time. And thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Watson. That was a great presentation. And let me say to all of you guys that are watching, I hope this is valuable to you. Let me encourage you again, share this with your real estate investor friends. This was meant to be done in such a manner that we could spread the information. Uh, if Note School can help you in any given way, we want to make sure that you understand there's a number of ways to reach out to us. You can simply go to noteschool.com. Uh, you can go to, you can get some training information if you want to go to uh, Note School TV. Uh, and how to do that is essentially go to noteschool.com forward slash TV, or you can simply email us at info at noteschool.com. Any ways that we might be able to help you in this process, we would love to do so. We have a lot of people seeking information about sub two, and there's a lot of missing information seemingly out there that we're wanting to help uh, uh, fill in the gaps to make sure that people can do this correctly and safely. We're not discouraging sub two in any way, shape or form. We are encouraging it. We are just encouraging it that people do it in an informed manner. So I hope this was helpful to you guys today. Thank you, Jeff Watson, for your incredible presentation. And we will see you next week on Note School TV.